番に身を置きながら団長クロロとの戦いを望むひそかは旅団へ復帰するネームクラピカに教頭を持ちかけていたさあどうする、okay. 君次第だ僕とクミカ一人でやるか Love the backdrop there The clown クラピカ大変よ捕まえた大男が逃げたわ、うん、奴が自力だか旅団の仲間がコミュニティの連中に変装して助けに来たらしいの Yeah. リーダーはそれが一切連絡がつかないのひそか一つ聞く日の目の行方を知っているか<笑>残念だが僕がああオッケー団長は獲物をひとしきりめでるとすべて売り払う日の目も例外ではないはずだ I was kind of like a skull from a distance 頭を潰さない限り雲を動き続け<笑>さっき組むかと聞いたが、一連卓上ってわけじゃない。情報交換を基本としたギブアンドテイクだ。Yeah. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. 互いの条件が合わなければ、それ以上の協力は無理強いなし。気楽だろ。Simple enough? 返答は明日、また同じ時間に。<笑><笑>実際の指示は彼が出して。それをリーダーが受けていたんだ。Someone's going to have to step up. リーダー以外は連絡先も知らないがな。ああ、ケイルさん。どちらにしろ、ボスに報告するしかないだろう。Oh yeah, you can just get it from her. ボス。The number. ボス。<笑>競売会場が盗賊に襲われました。Look at him, he's like traumatized. その際に、Shell shocked. イワレンコフ、トチーノの三名が殉職しました。<笑>じゃあミーロは？<笑><笑>本当に盗まれちゃったの絶対欲しかったのに、oh, man. 競売品はコミュニティが安全な場所へ移したようです<笑>なんだよかった Good approach, じゃあ Copica. 次の競売はいつまだわかりませんえー、なんで Yeah, she's certainly a child じゃあパパに聞いて携帯に番号入ってるからスクワラ、電話してくれえー、なんで俺だよこの中ではお前が一番の古株だろう。俺はとてもリーダーなんて柄じゃねえ。Clearly not. 全員で決めたらどうかしら。公平に。Good approach. とにかく早く連絡した方がいい。It's going to be crappy, guys, isn't it? 私はクラピカを押すわ。属を捉えたのも彼だし、適切な判断力もあると思う。この中では一番適任じゃないかしら。意義なし。俺もクラピカに一票。Yeah, there's a certain amount of respect there. Established already. Melody would have been fine as well in my books. ダイリのクラピカというものですが、これからどうするべきか、指示をいただけませんか。代理としての君の考えを聞こうか。娘さんを一刻も早くヨークシンから脱出させるべきだと思います。ヨークシン。彼女の望みは最大限尊重してやりたい。Oh. Yeah, that's going to be. 彼女の安全が最優先です。わかった。ネオンはなんとか俺が説得してみよう。Tomorrow is a long time from now. Ah. Ah. Okay. So the Nostrado family が York Sin Fkin de Shoyu Ster Booking Avagaruga. Oh, man. What's it on? Yeah, he'll get it. Any psychic queen made in a scratching I like on Shadio. Cora, take a no beer. The homie Franklin, clutch. Ore. Look at tiny looks. Hunter license. ハンターサイトなら
Hold on now, hold on now. Careful, careful. Yeah. Yeah, Sean Lark. He's essentially a leader. Oh, he's got concern, a lot of concern. Does this count as Ubo's theme? It goes so hard. Yeah. So Kropika knows that they'll... Yeah, they'll gain access to this information, yep. He knows they're coming. He's got a meeting, he's got a date. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Mm. I'll cut you some slack. Handy. Yeah. Spot on, actually. <laughs> yeah, Leo, yo, let's go, my guy. None of It'll have to be something else. Another approach. <laughs> Bit of deception. Spread the word of mouth. It opens up some other doors. Possibly. And he was holding back. Yeah. The legend of the kid in the street. Oh, did it reach the right channels? It did. Next level up. Yeah. Yes, Leorio. Clutch. <laughs> In his element, man. I love it. But is it big enough? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that guy. He thinks he's about to make a lot of money as well. Oh. Oh, okay. I thought it's like a fight club. It's inside of a ring. Ten percent. Whoa. Still. Ah. God damn it. That's why he was smirking. Gozo. <laughs> Hey, yo! <laughs> Change of plans. Oh, it's the true business. Yes, it is. They've met. The cutie. <laughs> Ah, interesting approach. <laughs> 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 Damn, 
に引き渡すこと20億ジェリーの小切手と交換させていただきます Poor bastards, most of them are gone. It ain't happening. It's not happening. <laughs> Kill. Interesting. Now, they truly need to link up with uh, Kropika at some point. Yeah, the scrubs are going to. Ah, but they don't want to be embarrassed. Yeah. Yeah. I'm to link up. Yeah. He's too dialed in, though. Is he going to? He's not in the right headspace at the moment. This episode looks great from a production standpoint. Yeah, he's dialed in. Oh. How? How'd you find out? Spot on. <笑>あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、
Again, big if. Uh, and I'll get into a bit of that in a moment. But if he gets himself in that position, and it's going to be essentially a new feeling, a new position altogether. As far as I know, it, if it goes through, it's going to be his first kill, right? Uh, hold on, give me a second, give me a second. Um, da, 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 yeah, yeah. I mean, as far as on-screen stuff goes, uh, yeah. Yeah, there hasn't been any mention of him killing anyone or actually doing it on screen to a character. Um, yeah, I mean, essentially, it is about to be um, an almighty test of his resolve, isn't it? On a few different levels. First of all, he's going up against a Phantom Troop member. You know, thinking about that is one thing, but actually actually being a part of it is something else altogether, right? And then, of course, like I said, if he gets to that point, can he cross that threshold, right? Can he kill him? I don't know, you know, a lot of questions, Ben, a lot of questions, but, you know, a lot needs to happen before he could find himself in that position, right? To kill him or not to kill him. Because listen, uh, Uvo could just as easily find himself in a position to kill Karapika, I think. But, you know, again, like I said, over the span of the few episodes since then, since my initial uh, take on the matter, I think, yeah, you know, Karapika has a lot of things up his sleeve at this point. I think he, he actually can match Uvo, right? It's all about strategy. It's all about perspective. It's all, it's all about how he's going to approach this. And like I said in the last episode, you know, there's a few things that are going to be a surprise for Uvo, right? And, you know, this is one of the reasons um, Shalnark, Shalnark, for the first time, essentially, since I've seen him, uh, got really quite serious, right? That cheerful smile as Uvo is departing isn't quite there. Right? Yes, he believes in Uvo's abilities. Of course he does, right? Because he's not he's not telling him to, you know, don't be reckless or anything. He's saying don't be careless because he's an intelligent person. He knows, right? Uh that yes, as 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 formidable as Uvo is, there's a lot of really impressive people out there. Because the focal point is going to be Nen. And Charlark knows that okay, you know, uh, there's more to it than just being the strongest, right? Yes, you know, in a, I don't know, significant amount of situations, being as strong and just, I don't know, a, a man mountain as Uvo, yeah, you know, for, for, for the majority of the situations he might find himself in, yeah, he'll excel and he'll probably come on top. But then there's always the other possibility, right? That he could be countered. Right? Anyone can be countered. That's see, my take is that, you know, through my understanding of the Nen abilities up until this point, you know, Nen styles make the fights. Right? It, you know, it's an age-old saying in combat sports, styles make fights. And just like in those situations, there's favorites, there's uh, you know, predictions, the safe money, but there's also upsets. But beyond just upsets, there's also, you know, revelations. You know, you might get a new blueprint to beating someone. You know, you see that a lot in combat sports. Uh, you know, a formidable fighter, someone who's on like an uh, incredible unbeaten streak and then comes along uh, some fighter, right? Who's clearly the underdog going into a set fight, a title fight or something. But then, you know, they, they beat the guy, right? And they have the perfect blueprint for it, the perfect game plan for it, you know? So I can apply a lot of that, you know, line of thinking to this upcoming fight, right? So, you know, essentially, if you're looking at it, of course, you know, you make Uvo the favorite, but I've also seen enough of Kropika and his approach over the span of these past few episodes to essentially feel comfortable and confident that he'll put up a he'll put a, he'll put up a damn good fight. He'll put up um, quite a resilient effort that he may have cooked up a blueprint to take out Uvo or you know a, a fighter of that ilk, right? Um, so yeah, it's exciting. It's really quite exciting. And listen, folks, let's be honest here. It's still early days in the anime. I mean, yes, I'm in the 40s at this point, but in the grand scheme of things, early days. So, you know, you kind of have to just look at it from a logical and realistic standpoint based on countless amounts of stories I've consumed and all of us have consumed, essentially. You know, Kropika is one of the main characters. He is a member of that principal cast. So, you know, can I really see a major upset? Can I see a big shocker, a big twist? Kropika actually dying, Uvo actually, you know, killing Kropika, I don't know, right? The moment you kind of look at it from that perspective, the, the, the answer becomes really quite clear, right? Realistically speaking, Kropika is not about to die, 
right? Again, you know, maybe maybe it'll shock me. Maybe it could shock me. But I think, you know, the safe bet is that, no, you know, they're not about to kill off Kropika. Certainly not this early. Because, listen, I'm not saying that, you know, they're above killing major characters or anything. It's just that it's it's a bit too soon. It's just the beginning of it. So beyond the final outcome, I think the really intriguing and exciting and fascinating aspect of this fight is the fight itself. How exactly is it going to play out? The back and forth, right? The ebb and flow uh, of the fight itself. Um, you know, Kropika's tricks. So it really could be the perfect time, the perfect stage to showcase yet another finger, right? Uh, because, you know, Chinjil is not the thing that he really needs at this point. That's not the ability that he needs at this point. I mean, it could be, you know, it could be at some point of the fight, right? Uh, actually, hold on. I, let, let me take that back. Yeah, it could be really quite effective in restraining Uvo, right? Uh, because again, like I mentioned in the last episode, at this point, Uvo, just like anyone else, believes that these chains are out at all times, right? At all times. So I think a really critical element of this fight is, um, you know, the notion of surprise, the element of surprise, rather. Uh, you know, Kropika has that on his side. So I'm excited. I'm really quite excited. But again, you know, let's see. If if he gets to that position, could he do it? Could he kill Uvo? And if that does happen, uh, it's going to make for a really interesting fallout, right? The connotations of it, right? If the Phantom Troop is to lose a member, right? If the news... I mean, if Uvo is to die at some point uh, in that fight, right? Of course, the news is going to get back to them. Um, because I, I think I think if it's to happen, I think Kropika might want to send a message. Because there's always a chance by doing so, he could agitate a few of them, right? Uh, even if you can agitate one of them to kind of lash out and rush in or something, again, that could gain Kropika another advantage, right? Put him in the driver's seat once again. But that being said, the troop is led by someone really, really quite impressive. And, you know, I've barely even actually seen much of him, and he still already feels impressive, right? In a lot of subtle moments, you, you can get a read on him. Hell, I even got a name for him. You know, it's, it's a bit of an unconventional name drop, and, you know, I've got to say it's a little bit disappointing, you know? I, I mean, it's not that disappointing, but I, I would have preferred something... You, in the, in the flow of the narrative, something that is a part of a scene. Um, and, you know, it doesn't have to be a dramatic scene either, right? It's just something that felt natural and felt like the right moment for the name. But, you know, instead it's delivered through the narrator. You know, what, it, you know once again, I have an issue, you know, with um, the narrator coming in and kind of giving information to the audience at maybe not the right time. Again, that's my opinion. Um, I, I just didn't like the delivery of the name. Right? Listen, this is not just any character. Right? This is the leader of the Phantom Troop, and he's been set up to be really quite the, the fascinating character. So, you know, the name drop, and let me take a stab at it, it sounded like Krolo, right? Krolo. Uh, so yeah, you know, I got a name. Uh, a little bit disappointed in terms of the delivery of the name, the, the reveal of the name itself, but yeah, you know, it is what it is. You know, to me, it almost kind of felt like, okay, you know, it's assuming that a lot of the people or most of the people that are watching this uh, series, the, the remake, essentially, you know, they know the name already. So, you know, they just kind of casually drop it through the narrator even, you know, maybe a bit of, maybe, maybe that's the line of thinking behind that. And, you know, at one point, Uvo learns about Neon, right? And her abilities, the fortune teller and all of that, right? As he's beating up on that scrub. And, you know, at that point, he gets his own, um, I don't know, confirmation that, yeah, you know, Chief Krolo, he, he, he was essentially spot on that, yeah, you know, there's no traitor, you know, it, it, they got information, they got tipped off uh, by something else, by someone else, and they acted accordingly, right? So, yeah, you know, he, he was satisfied about that. Yes, us audience knows that Hisoka is potentially a traitor from their perspective, right? At some point, he is going to be concerned a traitor. But again, for a different reason, you know, not for this situation specifically. But before the ending, you know, I thought, okay, you know, this could be interesting information that the leader uh, might want to hear about, right? But again, Uvo's the one who's got that information, but, you know, he's not returning. He's not returning. Hell, he might, he might not return at all, right? And, you know, the look, the look on Charlemark's face, the look of concern as the camera just lingers on his face for a few seconds, that's a look of concern, you know? That's a look of someone who may be thinking, you know, you know, what if that's the last time I get to see my friend, 
And I say friend because that's how it feels. It, oh my God, I love it so much. That's actually one of my favorite scenes of this episode and this arc so far. You know, those three, Franklin, Uval, and uh, Shalnark, just in that room, right? You know, you, like Franklin, he's like this big bear, you know, big bear friend. That's like, hey, I got you more beer. You know, that's a beer. They gave him that task. Uh, and he knows that, you know, his friend, his teammate needs this beer uh, for his condition. And he stuck to it, right? And yeah, he's like, here. He's like passing up the can here. Drink, keep drinking. And then you've got Shalnark, who's really quite concerned. Right? Because he knows, he knows, you know, maybe maybe Uvo has the tendency to get a, a little bit careless, maybe a little bit overconfident, right? And he knows there's a lot of special people out there, right? Again, this is an intelligent fellow, right? Once again, kind of reiterated by the fact that he is a professional hunter. He has that license. He has access to information, right? It, it, a lot of it kind of adds up, right? This moment of finding out that indeed he does have a license. Now, you know, I'm going to go ahead and assume that he actually took the test, uh, and actually earned it because I feel like it's not something he he's even been told to do. Maybe, 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 maybe that could be a part of it. But to me, or my understanding of the character is that, you know, this is someone who values information and knowledge. So, you know, he knew he can have access to a lot of things and unique information. So at this point, I'd say Sean Lark is one of my favorites from the Phantom Troop. Uh, certainly one of them, for sure. You know, I really like that character. I do. Uh, but yeah, you know, going back to that uh, notion of them being, um, you know, friends, right? Legitimate friends, because I felt that it felt authentic, you know? Uh, you know, there's that really lovely moment as Uvo gives him a little kiss, you know, for giving him all this uh, information that he can use and put into effect almost immediately. It's the kind of playful banter that you see between friends, right? You know, it felt so authentic to me, you know? Uh, believable, really quite believable. And, you know, at this point, it's really quite clear that it's not just a collection of impressive individuals. It's not, you know, there's a camaraderie there for sure, right? Believable, authentic, you know, there's friends, uh, you know, to me, it really feels like a lot of them consider a lot of these other members friends, they care for them. Uh, again, as showcased by um, Charlemagne's really legitimate concern. And even in Charlemagne's first appearance a few episodes ago, uh, you know, the Gathering of Heroes, iconic episode. You see how excited he is to see all of them. You know, it was so legitimate, so authentic. His joy at kind of reuniting after a long time, right? Uh, because like this said, it can be years before all of them really kind of get to see each other together. So yeah, I mean, at this point, it's really quite clear that I really enjoy the dynamic of the Phantom Troop. You know, ultimately, it's all a matter of perspective, isn't it? Uh, yes, you know, Uvo is someone who has wronged Kropika, right? Kropika has his reasons for going after him, for sure. But do I want Uvo to die? Do I want, um, uh, uh, you know, other members of the Phantom Troop to die? Do I want Kropika to kill Uvo or, you know, even beyond Uvo? I don't know. I don't, I, I don't really think so, to be honest. Uh, and, you know, there's two levels to it. Um, there's that element of it because, you know, I, I like the Phantom Troop, but also from the character arc and character... Uh, progression element, right? Do I really want to see Kropika kill? Right? Do I want to see him cross that line? Um, I don't know. I don't know, man. And this right here is a textbook example of how you do, um, you know, different types of characters or different ensemble casts within a story, right? Um, and really making it all about perspective because, you know, us as the audience, or maybe I should just speak for myself, but I'm sure there's many of you, uh, you know, a lot of you that enjoy the Phantom Troop just as much as I am so far. This group of characters also happen to be really quite compelling and fascinating, and that's how you do it, right? It would have been a totally different tone and dynamic if uh, most of these members ended up being, you know, one-dimensional uh, antagonists that are just really, you know, impressive in their abilities and maybe even the character design, but they, they don't really have a connection with each other, you know, again, a collection of impressive individuals, you know, this, the actual dynamic I'm getting here is so much more compelling and fascinating. It reeled me right in almost immediately, right? And it really is quite reminiscent of some of the other stuff I've seen already. Of course, you know, this came before um, stuff like Shingeki, but, you know, I watched Shingeki before this. So, you know, the the moment I get to see the Marley arc, right, the, the Liberio cast, you know, I immediately took to them, you know, really likable, personable, um, you know, authentic, believable connections between all of them. They care for each other. These are friends, family even, 
right? And I immediately took to them. Hell, you know, at points, I was actually backing them. I was cheering for them. I was, you know, sad for them. You know, I was getting teary-eyed for them. I, you know, I cared for them, right? That's how you do it. And, you know, that's one of the reasons um, I really, really enjoy the cast dynamic, the ensemble cast of Shingeki. It's one of the all-time greats, in my opinion. It's one of the reasons I enjoy season two of Shingeki so much because a lot of it is focusing on perhaps the supporting cast, right? If you're to kind of look at it from that perspective, you know, if if you consider Armin, Mikasa, and um, Eren, the, I don't know, the, the main cast, perhaps the protagonists, then at that point in season two, you can consider the rest of them uh, the, the supporting cast. But then you get a long stretch, a story arc within those 12 episodes of season two that is focusing on characters like Reiner, Historia, right? Emir, all of them, Connie and Bertolt, and, you know, exploring those cast dynamics. I, you know, I love season two. I think the thing is, I've actually heard um, that apparently season two is not that liked. That it, I don't know, a lot of people don't like it. You know, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, yeah, that's kind of surprising, really surprising to me because I think season two is just fantastic. And then, of course, I also think that the Marley arc is one of the strongest arcs in Shingeki as well. So I don't know. But let's get back to the topic at hand. I'll have much more to say about Shingeki uh, in the near future. But you know how I just mentioned Sean Lark having concern for his friend Uvo? Uh, let's shift the focus to the other side. You've got Gone now, who's, you know, who certainly has legitimate concern for Kropika, right? He's his friend. You know, they had a lot of, they had a lot of uh, bonding moments throughout the, the exam arc, right? The Hunter exam arc. Uh, so you see, you know, he's quite concerned for him at the moment, right? He just wants to get in contact, just kind of get, get to talk to him. But yeah, again, he's not, Kropika is not in that headspace at the moment. You know, now uh, it's not a time to be taking calls from uh, anyone. But also at the same time, it appears that Leorio actually did have some contact with Kropika at some point uh, because he knows enough um, enough about Kropika's current situation that yeah he's taken up a bodyguard position he's earned himself a bodyguard position hell he's even elevated himself at this point to the leader position right the newly minted leader of that security detail for uh, uh, a really high level you know high ranking mafia family right Nostrada and guarding his precious daughter and you know Kropika himself finds himself in really quite a surprising position because he didn't think he'll be he'll be getting this chance this soon you know and the chance essentially being him kind of making it into the good books of Nostrada the head honcho and because of it or through that kind of gaining access to that information information about some of these other high level uh collectors of human trophies right I mean he made his intentions really quite clear right he plans on going after all of them it's not as it's not as simple as just the phantom troop you know, his crusade has a few other pit stops, doesn't it? But you know my point about how uh, this anime also has a fantastic ensemble cast that you don't really need to focus on a, a specific character or a few specific characters at all times. The perfect example is this episode once again, right? It, or even the last few episodes. You barely, you barely feel the absence of uh, Gon and Killua and, and the, you know, the recently returned Leorio. Right? Of course, anytime they are on screen, I'm, I'm just so happy to see them. But, you know, over the span of the last few episodes, I, I didn't miss them. I'm so dialed in. It's just so compelling and fascinating. But at the same time, you see a bit of the disconnect as well. Because you see that Gon, Killua, and Leorio are just, you know, completely detached from Kropika's world at this point. Right? The things Kropika is going through. Uh, yeah, they're, they're just so detached from that. They have no idea. But I think a thing that this episode actually does really quite effectively and really quite organically is tying those three, right? Gon, Killua, and Leorio, tying them to Kropika's uh, storyline. Building that bridge now that they are kind of connected. Or at least the beginning stages of being connected. And again, this happens through them finding out about, uh, you know, essentially uh, a manhunt, right? A manhunt for these members of the Phantom Troop. Um, whose photos are taken as they're playing cards, right? As Uvo is doing his thing a few episodes ago. But, you know, that begs the question, who took those photos? Like, who physically actually obtained uh, those photos, right? Because at that point, they didn't know these are Phantom Troop members. But again, they didn't really need to know that those are Phantom Troop members to be taking photos of them. And by they, I mean, I, I suppose it could have been a scrub. Just some, you know, low level, not, I mean, low level in, in comparison to maybe some of the higher ups. 
uh, in terms of security detail, maybe even one of the shadow beasts, uh, right? Um, it's possible, but again, you know, maybe it's not even that big of a deal. Maybe I'm overthinking it. And of course, our boys recognized one of them. And then of course, Kidua, he puts it together really quite quickly, right? Based on some of the information he's getting. Um, yeah, he understands, ah, oh, yeah, you know, the fan, this is the Phantom Troop. You know, they are the only ones, the only ones crazy enough um, the only ones um, essentially bold enough to go after the mafia, to steal from the mafia, right? So it kind of connected everything now, uh, really quite organically. But it's also really quite telling, isn't it? For someone like Kilua who picked up on it almost immediately and then shares his thoughts um, that, you know, the mafia community, yeah, they're, they're backed up here. They're against the ropes. They need help. So essentially, you know, through the guise of uh, a hide-and-seek um, hunt, right? For money, for prize money, I suppose. They've essentially mobilized a massive amount of people and outsourced the manhunt, right? Not that it's going to make much of a difference. You know, no one's going to bring any of those Phantom Troop members back, right? Maybe, you know, maybe some of them might actually come across them, but, you know, uh, like I said, poor bastards, you know? <laughs> or maybe they'll lay low. Maybe most of them are going to lay low until 6 p.m. Uh, tomorrow night, right? As uh, Krolo. Um, specifies to our boy Hisoka as well. You know, you better be here as long as you're here by 6 p.m. But again, you know, as as uh, Karapika mentions, um, you know, he'll he'll be back. He'll be back the next day at 9 p.m. I believe he said. Um, so yeah, you know, if he is going to be back, that means at that point, uh, you know, he's beaten and potentially killed Uvo. So any potential exchange of information is about to be a fascinating one isn't it? If Hisoka and Krapika do meet up again, right? And then again, you know, in the beginning of the episode, they kind of established the type of um, team up that Hisoka is kind of looking for here, right? And yeah, logically and realistically, it's more of a information exchange based um, back and forth, uh, give and take type partnership rather than them actually physically teaming up, you know, going toe to toe as a team. Because to me, there's always something really quite exciting about uh, characters that are really quite unique in comparison to each other, really quite different from each other, kind of coming together momentarily, right? Because of the situation at hand. There is something exciting about that to me. And hell, you know, it is still exciting. They are still in contact. They are teaming up. But let's be honest, you know, even if it was just one quick scene, uh, one quick moment at some point, somehow it gets to that point, it, it, it could have been cool. It would have been cool to see Hisoka and Krapika at least team up for a scene, you know, actual in, in a fight sequence, right? It could have been cool. But yeah, you know, given their personalities and given, you know, uh, Krapika's personality as well and the things he kind of stands for, I suppose it's not the most realistic or uh, logical. And, you know, Hisoka, Hisoka gave him the terms and they are pre pretty clear cut, right? If at some point, uh, you know, it feels like um, it's not beneficial to either one of us, you know, there's no obligation. You know, they can easily just, you know, walk away from it. But see, here's the interesting bit. For things to kind of escalate, the story actually kind of does need Kropika to eliminate Uvo. Because if that happens, it almost guarantees a chain reaction, right? Um, because then, you know, of course, information or news gets back to uh, the Phantom Troop. And then, of course, uh, Krolo, Chief, it gets back to him. And he's already shown an interest in the chains. He's already shown an interest in this person, this individual who had Uvo for a bit, right? So if, if Kropika is to eliminate Uvo, and then once again, you know, the news reaches back to the Phantom Troop and the leader to the chief, then surely he's about to take a lot of interest in this chain end user, right? So yeah, you know, it's a bit of a domino effect. It's again, a bit of a chain reaction that could be caused by, you know, Uvo potentially getting eliminated by Kropika. So, you know, that's yet another reason I do believe, yeah, you know, that Kropika is not about to die here, is he? And then if Krolo, the chief, really takes an interest in the chain user in Kropika, then things become really fascinating and compelling because I, then I possibly get to see him step out and potentially get to see his approach. So, yeah, there's a lot of connotations to the possible ending of this fight. And also it's confirmed that Hisoka was not an active member at the time of uh, the massacre, right, of Kropika's clan. Um, but, he, you know, he still gave him some really interesting information. The Scarlet Eyes must have had the same path, right? At first, the leader takes an interest in the artifact itself, right? And once he's done, once he's gotten his fill, he, he sells it off. He, you know, they flip it. So, you know, that right there also tells you a bit about Krolo, 
it's not as simple as just flipping uh, you know, expensive and rare items. There is an element of actually being intrigued by these artifacts, right? He takes an interest in them. And the thing is, you know, Krolo is still such a mystery, but you know, one of those mysteries is his Nen capabilities, his Nen abilities, right? Uh, again, kind of confirmed to be a specialist alongside Neon in the silhouette shot for the specialists. So yeah, you know, I'm excited about that aspect of it as well. Because again, Neon's abilities are really, really quite special, <laughs> you know, just as the name uh, specifies. But also speaking of Neon, she gets news of the attack on the auction and that, you know, the leader himself has died and, you know, some of these other bodyguards have uh, died as well. You know, yes, initially, um, she's got a split moment of sadness, right? She's sad about it, but she almost immediately just forgets it. It's like in one ear and out the other because, you know, I suppose, yeah, in the grand scheme of things, that's not the thing that matters to her, right? She's still dead set on the mummy and the auctions and, you know, just shopping and kind of getting to see, the, I don't know, some casino, all of that, right? You know, essentially she's part of this bubble right? She's really quite naive. And listen, you know, I'm not, I'm not really criticizing her per se. It's, it's more to do with the fact that she's kind of lived in this bubble, right? This bubble of privilege her entire life. And I think a few episodes ago, I even called her a bit of a spoiled brat. Again, you know, that's not her fault. That's not her fault. That's how she's been raised. Uh, you know, it's a life of privilege. It really is. So um, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's to me and, you know, to anyone as an audience member, sure. You know, it's like, oh, damn. You know, because a leader, like I said, he had a bit of a connection. Uh, you know, not not a personal connection, but a connection in the sense that, yeah, she's been around him for a long time. He, he accompanies her privately, right, in cars and just, yeah, he's like a personal assistant almost. So, yeah, you know, it's a bit sad that he's been forgotten so easily and so quickly. But that's the life, I suppose, of uh, someone in that position, right? Uh, but, you know, the thing is, you know how I talked about not blaming uh, Neon for the way she is at the moment, right? That's her upbringing. That's just how it is. It really could be quite interesting to see her outside, right? Actually kind of getting to meet someone interesting, getting to meet unique and interesting, colorful people, right? Again, you know, people that are not out to hurt her, just interesting and fascinating people to kind of expand her horizons rather than being, you know, um, stuck in this bubble of hers, right? Get to see how people are. Ooh, also during the call, you know, Kropika and Nostrada himself, the head honcho, there's a moment. It's subtle. It's it's a quick moment. But at the mention of the Phantom Troop, you see Nostrada's reaction, right? Um, you know, his demeanor completely changes in a split moment. And, you know, they do that shaky eye animation that I see quite a bit in anime, right? Listen, you know, that's a name. He calls them the spiders, Right? He knows, he knows who the Phantom Troop are. Of course he knows, you know, he's someone in that position. Of course he's heard of them. So, you know, that right there tells you quite a bit as well, right? Uh, how the Phantom Troop is perceived by some of these uh, influential higher-ups in the Mafia community. And that potentially links to my speculation about Quolo's plans for the Mafia community. Because I do believe he's doing this for a reason. I'm sure he's got a blueprint, a roadmap uh, for the things he's essentially putting into um, into play at this point, right? By going after all of the Mafia community. But yeah, I think that should do it for this one, folks. It's really a fantastic table setting episode. Um, and it's all set up nicely for the next one, right? The stage is set. So if you enjoyed that, consider dropping a like, consider dropping some comments, give me your thoughts. If you are interested in early access to the next few episodes right now, uh, you know, full opacity, timer base full length, um, consider checking out the Patreon page and potentially supporting the channel. If you are interested, the links are in the description and the pinned comments, also links to social media, things like Instagram and Twitter and all of that. Right then, thank you so much for joining me, folks, and thank you for your time because time is precious. It really is. And I do hope to see you again soon for the next one. Until then, take it easy.